was always fascinated with 3D when he was a young man. He went to see the uh, movies and he saw something he's never seen before, which is a 3D movie. And what we didn't know when we were uh, talking about the 3D of the movie, we were invited to New York to screen something. And uh, we screened Marty's Personal Prince of Dial M for Murder and The House of Wax. So you have to be pretty passionate about the medium to buy those prints and own your own stereo prints. And, you know, most people don't know that Dial M for Murder, which is the Hitchcock film, was actually filmed in 3D. It was never released in 3D, because uh, by the time they released the movie, it was not uh, a 3D craze was sort of over. And um, uh, so he, he really loved it and wanted to not, because it was a film about film history, not only go to the future. We wanted to also honor the past of the way things were done uh, back in the day. And, and it, was, um, uh, it was a very interesting sort of a journey into it of combining the latest, very latest technology. And really what makes 3D work so well right now is digital projection. Uh, watching film prints uh, in, in 3D is very hard on your eyes because the, the, the both pieces of films are moving at different rates and your eyes are trying to fix them. So you get the classic headache that people would say you get from 3D. But digital projection, you don't get that. And uh, so we use the, you know, embrace the very latest technology, but with an eye to the past and, you know, how, how Alfred Hitchcock uh, staged some of his scenes and various things like that and how uh, the 3D that, of the things that he really liked, he wanted to emulate. Um, so it was, it was fascinating. I think when you start to stage and see the shot come to life in 3D on the monitor, then you could see how adding depth to the scene changes the drama and changes how you would stage it, changes kind of how, what the actors do. The actors now actually have another dimension to work. So if I were to lean forward in a 2D movie, you could barely see it. If I lean forward in a 3D movie, you could really sense my, my acting choice of wanting to get closer to you or just even withdrawing a little bit changes the acting a bit and so now you stage for that and it becomes so embroiled with the rest of the cinema arts the writing direction staging uh, uh, cinematography all the st all the disciplines are now married to this other edition and so you can't even remove it once once you're done because you made choices based on the depth you see so he got excited about it pretty quickly because you could see the possibilities, you could see what draw, what, what, how 3D really enhances drama, doesn't take away from it, like previously thought, that it's only really for action movies or spectacles or things like that. It actually works really well for intimate close-ups of people. It's really, it's really quite something. It was imperative creatively to do the stereo work on the set for the simple reason is that you would alter the shot based on the stereo that you're watching and you would alter it in many ways how the actors are blocked in the scene. Well, maybe you should take a step back here, maybe you should be over here, because now that I see it in stereo, I would re-essentially direct it, and, and Martin Scorsese would redirect the actors based on what he's viewing, and because that's ultimately what you're gonna see, as opposed to, I'm gonna take a normal shot, like a 2D shot, and then I'm gonna convert it later. Well, if I convert it later, or pay attention later, but not pay attention when I'm shooting, I can't go back and optimize it by saying, you know what, if you just want one more foot that way and I move the camera another foot this way, much better sense of depth in the scene, much more dramatic set use of depth in the scene. If I don't see it, I don't know to do it. And so it's, I use the, the same uh, 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 illustration as, as color. If you eliminate color from your everyday working palette and you say, well, I'm just going to view everything in black and white, and then later you want to add somebody in color, the actor didn't wear the red shirt in the scene, the other actor didn't see them, the cameraman didn't see the way it looked on film, so he didn't light it a particular way, and all of a sudden now the color that you add has no artistic merit, it's just dumped on top. And the same thing is true for stereo. If you just add it later, you're, yes, you're adding the illusion of depth, but the depth isn't helping you tell the story. In set, sometimes it actually can distract you from telling the story because it's not incorporated in the artistic choice of that particular setup. So to me, the, the, there's a creative reason why it's imperative to do it. Uh, uh, and you have to view it as you're doing it because that's where you make all your adjustments and you have the power to move all the chess pieces around to optimize the, the, the illusion of depth. And it's no longer illusion, it's, it's real and it affects the drama. It is not something that's just thrown on top of drama, it becomes the drama. 
And so it's, it's, it's very important that it's be done at the time. One of the things that worked very well in our, to, to our advantage was in a happy accident is that we had, uh, uh, because it was an old stage, there was dust in the air when we went to shoot. Normally you wait for the dust to subside because it's a little distracting. We discovered that the dust in the air was no different when you put the glasses on and looking at the monitor as the dust that was in the picture. So dust was really in front of you and then dust was in the in the, the the 3D monitor, they were the same, and it was like, wow, that really makes you feel like you're in this environment. And so we added dust to all the shots live, because while I'm looking at you, I have this other sense of depth that I'm in the same environment you're in by having little tiny pieces of things, not big enough to distract you, but enough to make it feel like what you're used to feeling like when you're in an environment where there is some particulate in the air, which there mostly is all the time, and you're not really aware of it. But when you have a pristine movie set and you don't have any, it tends to feel that way. So this, so we did it by accident. It was just, you know, you put the glasses on, you look at the take, and the dust that's still floating around looks like the dust that's, and it's like, wow, that's a great, thing and we 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 capitalized on it and there's other accidents that happen it's just you set up the shot and you go well that's kind of boring let me do one thing well you know why it's boring because we didn't light back there and you add just one little bit of light all of a sudden you have this tremendous sense of depth to it it really feels more cavernous it really feels whatever and you take advantage of it and those are the things that you want to you want to have um, and at your disposal because it's yet another tool just like lighting is a tool to enhance drama you can shoot under these lights, but it's not going to be very dramatic. It's not going to really help your scene much. Uh, or you could light it. And if you can light it, then you're the, the director of photography w with the director, you know, direct how it looks. You might, wa might be in shadow, you might walk into light because you chose to do it for the nature of the scene. Well, stereo works, you know, in a similar way. And on this movie, I think the art form of all the co collaborators, led by Martin Scorsese, really pays off where everybody works together to make one picture the best it can be. And, and we were very fortunate to work with the Dante Ferretti's of the world and, and Bob Richardson and Thelma Schoonmaker and Sandy Powell and um, uh, 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 Howard Shore and all these great artists in their own right led by one of the most enthusiastic you know, uh, film historians and, and one of the great directors of all time you know, being the band leader for all this stuff. It was just, you know, it becomes a, a, a pure joy to work on a movie when you're making that kind of movie with those kind of people.